video of mine. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, but um, hopefully you can put up with me being uh, yellow today. I uh, just put a timer on my phone, so I'll make sure I don't overrun. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation uh, tonight to speak to you about our Searching for Ski VSB project. Uh, so my name's Liam Moulds and I'm Conservation Officer for the charity Bug Life. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of talk to you about um, our project that we've been doing that actually finishes on, on Monday. But just talk to you about um, the target species for our project and hopefully give you a bit of um, an idea really of how, you, how to go about identifying these bees and hopefully um, next year or in the over the coming years you can really be aware of these bees and look out for them and hopefully um, find new populations. It's uh, the real sort of goal of it all really. Um, so the project is a short-lived project so it only started on the 1st of, of July and uh, finishes um, on Monday and it was funded by the postcode, um, People's Postcode Lottery. And, and the real aim of the project really is to raise awareness of some of Wales' most threatened uh, solid bees and increase knowledge of their distribution and conservation status within Wales as well. And um, the, the project had a couple of different outputs really, was to um, survey known and historic sites uh, for um, our target bees, uh, plus sites to support suitable habitats. So this was all to provide sort of up-to-date and distributional data that we hope that would inform management on the ground to benefit these bees. We also go about sort of recording and mapping um, existing patches of scabious plants on those sites, um, giving landowner advice as well so that they get better management of those sites and help to sort of restore and re enhance um, the habitat for these bees. And one of the sort of reasons why we're here today really I suppose is to deliver sort of training sessions to increase the number of people that are sort of uh, trained up in the identification and just generally aware of these bees so that they'll be able to go out and, and hopefully look for these bees and it will hopefully generate more records then over the coming years uh, that can help the conservation of these species as well. So the, the project has um, four target bee species, uh, which are the ones pictured here. Uh, so in the top left there, you've got the large scabious mining bee, um, Andrina hatorfiana. Um, in the bottom left, you've got armed nomad bee, Namada amata, which is um, the associated um, cuckoo bee um, of the large scabious mining bee. And then on the top right there, you've got the small scabious mining bee, and then you've got um, that species associated cuckoo as well, which is the silver sided nomad bee in the bottom right. So we've got these two species of scabious bee, and they are two associated cuckoo bees as well. And the reason we've sort of um, targeted these bees in particular is because um, they've all undergone um, a widespread decline and they've been lost from um, a number of their, their sites across England and Wales. Uh, so, that, so unfortunately they are, they are struggling and that's due to a loss um, of scabious rich sort of grassland habitats. So I, I'm going to kind of guide you through really um, a basic sort of bee identification um, training session, I suppose, and then come on to the, our target bees in particular. Um, so just by sort of way of an introduction as to of what a bee is, I'm sure many of you know this, but um, bees are of course insects, so they have this three-part body with three pairs of legs. Uh, they belong to the order the Hymenoptera, uh, which means that they got two pa pairs of uh, wings um, and a, a sting as well. They belong to the superfamily, which is Apoidea, so all the bees belong to this um, Apoidea superfamily. Um, and quite a few fact about bees is that they're actually wasps, so they're descendants of um, a group of wasps that used to hunt thrips, which are little tiny little insects that you often find uh, within flowers. Um, and this group of, uh, of wasps um, obviously one day um, decided in an evolutionary sense to um, instead of uh, predating these thrips that they would instead feed the young on pollen and that's what's given rise to the bees that we know today. Um, and bees have been around a long, long time, so they evolved around 125 million years ago, so well before the last mass extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and there are over 20,000 species of bee worldwide, so they're quite a species-rich group. Um, and there are five times more uh, species of bee than there are mammals on the planet, um, and three times more than there are birds. So they're really fascinating uh, group of insects. Uh, within the UK, we have um, quite a good diversity and um, a lot more than what people generally expect. So uh, once you rule out the species that we believe have gone extinct, um, that leaves us with about 255 species of bee in Britain. Um, this includes so 24 species of bumblebee, uh, the one honeybee species as it is across the whole of Europe, um, and then about 230 species of solitary bee. And this is a number that changes every year with climate change. 
them as well. And, and you can think of bees um, as pollinators, and we all know that they're very efficient pollinators, um, but they're also pollen eaters as well, so they actually consume the pollen. Uh, so that's quite an interesting thing. And, and all bees uh, visit flowers, so they visit flowers for the nectar, so the nice sugary source that they use um, uh, for energy. Um, and then they also collect in pollen as well, which is probably the most crucial part really for them is gathering the pollen because the pollen is used uh, for larval growth and it's also used in the egg production of the females as well, the adults. So it's really important, the pollen. Um, so once you've established, uh, well, the first step really in bee identification is to work out if you're looking at a bee or, or something else. Um, and quite often there's quite convincing um, hoverfly um, hoverflies and mimic bees, um, so you've got to kind of rule out these uh, hoverfly mimicking um, flies. Um, so yeah, so the first thing to do really is to, to work out if you're looking at a solitary bee or a fly, and, and the real best thing really is to look at the head of the insect. I always think that's the best. So um, the things are really on, on a bee, uh, something like a solitary bee, the eyes um, are quite small and situated on the side of the head, as you can see in that picture there. Um, in contrast, uh, flies tend to have large, large eyes that cover most of the head and particularly in the males. So we've got um, a male here where the eyes actually meet um, on top of the head and they almost look like uh, they're wearing sunglasses on top of their head. So the very large eyes um, is quite distinctive um, of, of flies in general, particularly hover flies. Um, another thing then really is the antennae. So the antennae of solitary bees um, are long, um, often elbowed or arched, whereas in, in flies, um, particularly hoverflies, they tend to be quite small and hard to see. So just by looking at the head of an insect can really tell you quite a lot. Um, and you can help, help to tell you whether you're looking at a bee um, or a fly. And another thing can be the wings as well. So flies have one pair of wings, whereas bees um, also have two pairs of wings, but it can be quite difficult to see those two pairs um, in bees sometimes. So once you know that you're um, looking at um, a bee, the, the real main thing really is to establish whether you're looking at a honeybee or something else. And honeybees um, uh, are quite the confusion really when you're sort of trying to identify solitary bees. So when you're at a beginner level, it can be quite tricky as to differentiate in what a honeybee is um, and why it's different to a solitary bee. There are a number of key characteristics on a honeybee that are really distinctive. Um, and once you know them, it's really easy to identify honeybees. Um, one thing you can do is to look at the head because the eyes um, of honeybees are actually hairy. So actually over the lens are long hairs. So particularly where you've got a, a top down view of the head, you can see that how hairy the eyes are. And even in the side view image, you can see you've got a long fringe of, of hairs actually on, on the eye as well, particularly lower down on the face as well. Um, another key thing really is to look at the hind legs. Uh, so the, the, the legs at the sort of rear end of the insect um, if you look at the hind uh, tibia, which is almost equivalent to our sort of um, thighs, it's got a, a flat sort of shiny area surrounded by long hairs. And this is the pollen basket. So this is where the honeybee, um, what it does, it, it mixes pollen with regurgitated nectar and then sticks that in the pollen basket. Uh, and the pollen basket is, is used then really to transport that pollen back to the, back to the hive. Um, so no no um, solitary bees will ever ever have a pollen basket. It's a character that's only found in bumblebees and honeybees. So that pollen basket is really a key thing. Uh, honeybees also have this swollen bassy tarsus. So the first segment of the, the tarsi or the feet um, have a very swollen segment, as you can see on the arrow there, which is almost a continuation of the pollen basket really. So this is used for storing uh, pollen to take back to the nest. So if you see bees flying with massive balls of yellow stuck to their hind legs, uh, then it's only really going to be either a honeybee or a bumblebee, but of course bumblebees look very different um, to, to honeybees. Hopefully you recognize uh, bumblebees. And this is just um, a closer look uh, at that pollen basket. So you can see a nice flat shiny area surrounded by long, long hairs. Um, and then you've got that swollen first segment of the, of the feet as well, the bassy tarsus. Uh, in contrast, um, solitary bees will have a pollen brush. Um, and I should mention this is a female only characteristic because only the females are collecting pollen. So no male honeybee will ever have a pollen basket and no male uh, solitary bee will ever have a pollen brush. Uh, but the females will have a pollen brush um, and this will be either on the underside of the abdomen, uh, in the case of the leaf pepper bee on the left there, uh, or it'll be on the hind legs, uh, in the case of the mining bee on the right. 
Um, so uh, unless it's um, some sort of cuckoo bee, which again, don't collect pollen, you'll always have this pollen brush present. Uh, so once you see the, um, a bee that's got a, a pollen brush, which is just a dense um, covering of hairs that you used to collect the pollen, uh, then you kind of know then if you're, you're looking at a, a female solitary bee. And, and solitary bees um, comprise the majority of bees uh, worldwide. And you can really think of the females as hardworking uh, single mothers. They're all capable of producing offspring. So unlike honeybees where you get sterile workers, um, in the case of solitary bees, all the females are capable of producing their own offspring. Um, and we think of them as hardworking single mothers because they build and maintain their own nests. So they don't have any workers to do any of the foraging or nest building or anything for them. Um, and they also got to go out and provide all the food necessary really to provide for their young. So they again, don't have the workers to do the, that for them. So they have quite a tough little lives um, and they typically live alone. That's why we call them uh, solitary bees. So they don't form um, nests or hives in the same way as bumblebees and honeybees do. Um, but there is some form of sort of communal nesting. So solitary bees uh, sometimes nest within sort of close association with each other, or they might even share the same nest entrance, but there's actually no cooperation between the females. And I just kind of want to go through um, the mining bees now, because they comprise two of our target uh, species belong to the group uh, Andrina, which are the mining bees. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about their key um, identification features now. Um, so the Andrina or the mining bees are the largest sort of bee genera in Britain. So we've got 61 different species um, of mining bee. Uh, they're so-called mining bees because they, they nest underground. So they actually um, excavate nests, so they mine into the ground. Um, they're most easily separated really from all other um, bees because they have what we call facial fovea. Um, so these are bands of velvety hairs along their inner eye margins. Uh, which I'll come on to um, in a sec. So that's a really useful characteristic. Um, and this is believed to be used um, in community and underground um, where females are sharing the same nest entrance. And when they bump into each other in the dark, um, they can touch the little antennae on these uh, facial fovea, uh, which have glands underneath. Uh, so they can co communicate then through, through chemicals. Um, and the majority of our mining bees um, are univoltine, which means that they only have one flight period in a year, but there are some that have uh, two generations in a year, so they might have a spring generation and a summer generation, but most of them only fly for one period um, in the year, and depending on what sort of species that can be, it could be um, early spring or it could be a summer species and so forth. Um, but generally, most mining bees are found in spring, um, and they're not particularly efficient at producing offspring, so um, the vast majority of them produce less than 10 offspring in their life, life, life uh, span. And most of them don't live more than 10 to 14 days as well. So it's a, a real tough little lives and you really want to come back as a, a solitary bee, I don't think. Um, in terms of the facial fovea, so this is um, a head view of a, a mining bee. Um, and you can see here the, the bands of velvety hairs along the inner mine margins, which are the characteristic really for identifying um, mining bees. Again, this is a, a female only characteristic um, and it's often the way that females are easier to identify in bees than, than males. Um, but if you see any bee that's got these bands of velvety hairs along the inner eye margins, then that's only ever going to be a, a mining bee. And um, so the best way to think about of these uh, facial fovea is to think of eyeliner. So if you see a bee with eyeliner, then you know um, you're looking at a mining bee. And where they're particularly pale, so in a species like this, which is the sand pit mining bee, which is quite a common species that you get on sand dunes and also um, in sand pits on golf courses and so forth. The bands are really pale, so they really stand out. You can see them um, on that image there. And other species, they might be brown velvety hair, so they might be a little bit less obvious, but quite often they're pale and quite easy to spot once you know what you're looking at. So the first of our target um, species really as part of the project is a large scabious mining bee. Uh, so this is a rare species. Uh, red data book three species um, and it flies from about late June um, to about mid-August and it forages um, only on field scabious and small scabious so just those two two plants uh, in particular that's all you'll collect pollen from uh, so you tend to find it in habitats that are obviously rich uh, in these plants and you can see the UK distribution here is very much uh, limited and very much southern uh, southern England and South Wales um, and it's um, quite a distinctive um, 
salty bee in the sense that it's very large. So it's Britain's largest mining bee, and it's substantially larger than a honeybee. So if you get familiar with the honeybee size, uh, this is quite a bit big, bigger than that again. And I'm going to come on to some of the key characteristics for identifying it next. Uh, within Wales, this is the, the distribution a bit more uh, clearly. So we've got some populations um, on the South Pembrokeshire coast, we've got um, one population that we know of on the, on the Gower, and then a couple of other sort of other populations, particularly around uh, Monmouthshire. As you can see, there's no, no Carmarthenshire on there yet, but in theory, it kind of should be. Um, so there's definitely some scope, I think, for, for finding new populations. And the white areas are where populations have been lost, and then uh, red is kind of where we know that there's sort of records within the last 30 years, but even some of those populations might have been lost now as well. Um, in terms of the identification of this species, um, you're obviously looking for a large bee that's foraging on field scabious or small scabious. Um, so that's a really key thing. Um, as well as that, then, um, as well as the large size and on those plants, they're also a rather hairless bee. Uh, as you can see on, on these images, and particularly uh, if we look at the thorax, that's sort of middle segment um, of the body, it almost looks like the hairs have been completely worn off, but this is kind of what they look like. Um, all the time. So they're, they're very rather hairless, they're quite unusual I suppose in, in uh, solitary bees in the sense that they don't have much body hair, so that's a really useful characteristic. Um, these are all females and you can see they got the nice pale facial fovea or the eyeliner, so you know these are female um, mining bees. Um, another key characteristic really is that they have um, they come in a red banded or a black banded form, so red on the left there and the black banded form on the right. And it's no real, um, but it's hard to work out really, I suppose, which ones you're going to come across. It's pure luck really as to whether you come across red banded forms or the black banded forms. It doesn't seem to be any real uh, prediction as to which forms you're going to get. Um, but when, you're, when you get these red banded forms and they're really distinctive. Uh, but another characteristic really is these bands um, of hairs along the uh, sides of the abdomen. So really quite obvious in the two images on the right there. Um, so when you've got these nice pale bands, that's another useful characteristic. And the, the end of the abdomen as well, which um, might not be clearly um, visible in this, these images, but they have um, a nice sort of orange tail. So it's a nice sort of dense um, sort of brush of uh, orange hairs right at the very tip of the abdomen as well. So you're kind of putting together all of these different characteristics. So you're looking for a large bee that's foraging only on um, small scabious or field scabious, that has, has these sort of narrow hair bands on the abdomen, um, very little body hair at all, and uh, might be red banded or it could be black banded, uh, with this nice sort of um, orangey or golden sort of uh, tail at the end of the abdomen. Um, and that's, that's basically it. It's a really distinctive species that could be done from photographs. So, uh, if you obviously forget this come, come spring uh, or well, summer, um, then you know, if you get a photo of this, you can look it up later and it's a nice clear one to identify. The males on the other hand are, are very different. Um, and I haven't really talked much about differentiating males and females, but the males won't have a pollen brush, so they'll never have that dense brush um, on the hind legs because they don't collect um, pollen. And they also tend to be a lot sort of duller looking and uh, a lot slimmer as well. And the females are more robust. Um, but in, in this particular species, the, the males have these wonderful sort of white uh, faces, which uh, very few um, male mining bees have this sort of white face. And it's got these two little black dots on them as well. Um, and this is quite distinctive. And you've had a photo of the face that would help um, identify that species. Um, it's also quite, quite large, but unless you're familiar with the size um, of different solitary bees, it might be hard to pick out. Um, but if you're getting sort of quite a dark bee with a, a whitish face that's in those sort of same areas, then you're really sort of, there can't really be any other um, options. And they got these quite smoky wings as well. So they're quite, instead of being quite a clear wing, uh, the wings are quite uh, dark, uh, which is another quite useful characteristic for identifying these as well. But more than likely, you're, you're going to see more females than you'll see males anyway. So it's a lot easier with the females. Uh, the next species that uh, uh, we were targeting really is a small scabious mining bee and this is probably the one that you have greatest chance of finding within Carmarthenshire. So this is um, a nationally scarce species so it's not as rare as the previous species but as you can see it's found right across the UK but it's been lost from a huge number of sites so it's only the darkest spots uh, where we got sort of modern populations 
all the Apala spots where they've been lost. So they've been lost from a huge number of sites, particularly in southern England and a few in Wales as well. Um, and this species is found from mid-July through to late September. And, and interestingly, you find them on in two very different sort of habitats. So you'll find them on calcareous soils foraging on small scabious and field scabia, so the same plants as the previous species. So you can look for the two species uh, at the same time, which is quite handy. And these populations will be peaking sort of late July, early August time. And then you have another separate population that forages only on devil's bit scabious. Uh, the peaks in late August and early September or whenever the devil's biscavus is at its peak um, on the grass since it is found. So these two very different populations uh, that could be genetically distinct, uh, but at the moment we think they're one species. Um, so you have two, well, you have more opportunities really to look for this uh, because you've got our option for looking on devil's biscavus um, as well as small scabious and field scabious. Uh, within Wales, this is this sort of distribution, so very patchy distribution again. Uh, as you can see, Carmarthenshire isn't on the list, but um, as we know, sort of Carmarthenshire is um, the sort of best area for marsh fertility butterfly um, within Wales. So you've got plenty of roast pasture, marshy grass, and habitat that's got devil's bit scabious. So I'd be really, really surprised if you haven't got this bee lurking somewhere uh, within uh, Carmarthenshire. So I think if you know of any areas that really got good amounts of uh, devil's bit scabies are really handy going out perhaps next summer um, and autumn and looking for, for this bee. Um, but yeah, as you can see, very patchy distribution. Again, it comes in these red banded forms and these black banded forms. Um, so it's very similar in that, in that sense to the, the large scabious mining bee. Um, but this is a much smaller species, so it, it's probably harder to spot, I suppose, because it, it's a much smaller species, much more typical of a lot of solitary bees. Um, in its sort of size, and it's, it's very different in other respects. So um, where the previous species was um, very hairless, this has got a really kind of dense um, brown uh, thorax. So that's a really useful characteristic. So a nice brown, brown hairy thorax or middle of the body is one handy thing. Um, whereas the previous species had very strong sort of hair bands on the side of the abdomen, this has very weak bands. So there's the hair bands are almost non-existent, but you can just about faintly see them uh, if you look carefully. Uh, so that's another characteristic. Um, even in the dark banded forms, it's usually some sort of orange uh, sort of color comes through. So that's quite handy um, as well. Of course, the, the plants that they're foraging on also narrows it down. Uh, so if you're seeing a bee of this description on field scabia, small scabia, or devil scabia, then that's really narrowing it down the options um, as well. Um, and they also got, um, the females have got this uh, pollen brush and when it hasn't got pollen on it, it's actually black, um, which is really hard to see, but in the bottom left image there, um, it's sort of a black haze on the top of the pollen brush. Um, but like, I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's, it's quite a distinctive species, again, that could, could be done uh, from photographs. So you're looking really um, at the forage plants. Um, so if you see a bee on those plants I've mentioned with weak bands on, on the abdomen, weak hair bands, um, an obvious lovely brown uh, thorax, um, and then a nice sort of dark haired pollen brush, so the hind legs are nice and dark, then you basically um, go into a small scabious mining bee really and not much else. Uh, the males again are very similar to the previous species in that they're very dark, um, rather nondescript looking things, but apart from their face again has got that white patch with a Black little spots, which are difficult to tell here. If you had a photo of the head again, you could identify it to species level because the, the face is the, the pattern on the, of the white is slightly different between the large scabious and the small scabious mining bees. Um, and a key characteristic as well is the wings are clear, whereas on the males of the previous species were smoky as well. But again, you're more likely to see the females than you are the males, so wouldn't worry too much about that. And the females are always easier to identify anyway. This is the small scabious and the large scabious mining bee side by side, and you can see why they get their name. So the large scabious mining bee is obviously very big, and then the small scabious mining bee is a lot smaller. Um, so that's basically it. But you can see a lot of those characteristics that I've talked about. So on the large scabious one on the left, you can see how hairless that is, and um, very hairless, apart from the legs really, and the tip of the abdomen is very much the body is hairless. Nice big pale um, hair, uh, facial phobia or eyeliner. Um, so just about visible, um, but yeah, large size, very hairless, 
Um, nice sort of hair bands on the abdomen and a nice golden tail. That's basically sums up your large scabious mining bee. And then your small scabious mining bee then will have a nice sort of browny thorax, um, dark hairs on the pollen brush, on the hind legs, um, not much in the way of hair bands on the abdomen. Uh, and that pretty much sums up that species as well. So hopefully that hasn't been too confusing. Um, you could uh, potentially confuse them with a few other things, um, but I wouldn't particularly think um, you would really confuse them, but I've thrown them in anyway. But there are other bee species that have got some sort of red on the abdomen. One of them is the red girdled mining bee on the left, which is a species that you wouldn't really get in the same habitats. This is very much an urban species that you get more in, in towns um, and sort of villages a bit more than out in the countryside. Um, and it also is flight period ends in late June. So it's usually sort of before really the scabious bees get going. So that kind of rules that one out. Um, and then the other species, which is Perkins mining bee, uh, Andrina rosa. And, and that's a species then, the, the summer generation of this, there's a spring generation and a summer generation. But the spring generation, that's act, uh, the summer generation, sorry, that's active at the same time as our scabious bees only forages on umbellifers. So again, it won't even be on those uh, scabious plants in theory. So um, again, you shouldn't really be using them as well. Uh, probably the biggest confusion would be when you're looking um, for small scabious mining bee populations on devil's bit scabious. Because you've got your small scabious mining bee on the left there. Um, and this uh, species on the right is the common furrow bee. And you'll see loads of these common furrow bees on devil's bit scabious. They're very, very common species. Um, and they superficially look similar. So this furrow bee's even got little bits of translucent orangey kind of edges to the um, abdominal segments on. Um, that almost look like the orange that you get on the abdomen of some of these small scabious mining bees. Uh, but the key thing is really is that the head again, so um, the, the female furrow bees, which is this, this one is, um, it doesn't have uh, these facial fovea, those eyeliner, where as our small scabious mining bee on the left does, um, the angle isn't quite obvious, but uh, there's little pale facial fovea there. Uh, also the thorax again of the small scabious mining bee is nice and brown. Um, nice and furry, as I've showed in the previous slides, uh, whereas these furrow bees haven't got a very fit furry uh, thorax either. So there's a couple of different characteristics going on. And these furrow bees also have um, a furrow at the end of their abdomen, which is what gives them their name. So they have this little furrow right at the end of the abdomen, um, which you can really think of as a bum crack. So if you see a bee with a little bum crack, then you know you're looking at a furrow bee. So again, um, that sort of separates them from the mining bees as well. So there are a few different characteristics you can look at um, there as well. Um, one, what, well, I suppose the males um, of some of these furrow bees can again also have bits of red on them and superficially you might think, oh, is that one of these scabious bees? Um, but the males of these have, have got yellow on the legs and none of our uh, mining bees ever have yellow on the legs. So the actual um, leg segments itself are actually got bits of yellow on them. So again, if you see any bee with actually um, yellow body parts, then that instantly rules out um, our mining bees there as well. So hopefully there's not too much you can confuse them with um, in theory. Um, so then the next group I'm just gonna touch on really are the, the nomad bees. So two of our target species are, are nomad bees. Um, so the group, um, the Marda, um, includes 36 different species of rather wasp-like looking bees. So a lot of people might see um, nomad bees in their garden, but actually confuse them uh, with wasps. But these are actually um, cuckoo bees or brood parasites. They sneak into the nests of other bees, um, particularly of mining bees, but they're associated with other bees as well. Um, and well, they, they're quite clever in the sense that they, they wait for the, the female to go out foraging and then they sneak in and lay an egg and then sneak back out. So effectively then, um, this um, nomad bee then, little grub ends up feeding um, on the pollen stores that were intended for, for the other, the, the host bee instead, um, which is a little bit sneaky. Um, and these nomad bees are best found in spring because most of the species are associated with mining bees. Um, so when the mining bees are active, that's when the nomad bees are active. Um, but there are some, several other sort of summer active species at the present um, as well. Um, and when you see nomad bees, it's really useful because uh, it helps to tell you really that you've got mining bees or some other group of solitary bees nesting in that area because these will be looking at, looking for the nest and hoping to sneak in. 
So we have uh, two species of, that we're targeting as part of this project. The first one is the silver sided nomad bee. So this is a rather rare species, as you can see, is again kind of known only from southern England. It's also known from South Wales, uh, but it's not on the map there. Uh, I'll come on to in a sec. Um, it's found from mid July to mid September um, in scabious rich habitats. And this is the, the cuckoo bee associated with a small scabious mining bee. So it's found in this, for the same period of time in the same sort of habitat. So you'll get um, populations that are associated with um, the earlier flying populations that forage on field scabious and small scabious. And then you'll have other populations that are associated with devil's bit scabious um, as well. So you've got almost two options again. Um, you have twice the chances really of looking for this species because uh, you can look for the two different populations of its host, um, which is quite handy. In Wales, it's known from only one site, um, which I can't believe is the case. It's got to be somewhere else, given how much, particularly in the way of um, the devil's bit scabious with grasslands we've got in South Wales, it must be somewhere else. Uh, but at present, it's known only from one site in the north of RCT, um, in the Hirwine, uh, where it hasn't been seen since 2004, so it might have even gone extinct, but we haven't been able to find it as part of the project, unfortunately. Um, but I'm really hopeful it's hanging on there, um, or at least somewhere else in South Wales. It's a really distinctive species. It's small and dark, um, obviously very wasp-like, like all the nomad bees are. Um, but it's got this sort of rather dark um, abdomen with a red band going through the middle. Um, but the real key characteristic really is it's got these dense patches of silver hairs on the side of the um, abdomen where the arrows go into there. So that really um, helps to define that species. And that's what gives it its name, the silver-sided nomad bee. So nice bands of silver hairs. And this is a character that's found on both males and females of this species as well. So if you're seeing a dark little bee um, on um, any of these plants, devil's bit scabious, small scabious, or field scabious, it's got these silver patches, then you're onto a winner then, basically. It's really nice. And then our, the final species uh, that we were looking through for as part of the project is the armed nomad bee, the Marder amata, which is an endangered species, as you can see, is known from very, very few sites. It's been lost from a large number of sites as well. This main sort of um, area now is kind of like Salisbury Plain and that sort of area of southern, southern England. Um, it hasn't been seen in Wales since 1854, so it's uh, obviously long presumed extinct, but um, who really goes looking for these species half the time? Uh, could it be hanging on somewhere? Um, I'm hopeful that it is. Um, it was known from Swansea, so um, not far away at all. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been seen for a long time. And this is the cuckoo um, of the large scabious mining bee. So a nice big species found on scabious rich calcareous grasslands, the same habitats uh, as its host and flies from late June, so sort, of, sort of early August time. Really distinctive species to identify. Um, again, it's large size, um, so it's probably our largest um, nomad bee. Um, it's got a nice red abdomen with yellow spots and the yellow spots are quite large. So it's quite a uh, distinctive characteristic. It's also got these nice patches of silver hairs at the, at the side and the back of the thorax, which is really distinctive and they're really dense as well, which is uh, really quite key. Uh, but the real main thing really for identification is that the females of this species have got these banded antennae. So the antennae um, are orange with a nice black band going through them. And there's only one other species of nomad bee um, that have these banded antennae, um, which I'm gonna come on to on the next slide. Um, and that's this species here, which is Fabricius's nomad bee. Uh, which is a much, much smaller species. This is actually a very small species, um, perhaps only like about five millimeters long or thereabouts, maybe even smaller than that. Um, and it, um, it's got the yellow patches, uh, yellow spots on the side of the uh, abdomen, but these are much smaller. Uh, it's also got black bands um, on the red abdomen as well, which is not present um, in our target species. It's also got some hairs on the back of the thorax um, and the side of the thorax, but these are nowhere near as dense and as silvery. Uh, but you can see it's still got those banded antennae. But this is a species you get quite commonly in gardens. It's not one that you'd expect to get um, in the sort of scabious rich grass and habitats that you'd find um, the armed snow might be. So hopefully there's nothing really to confuse it with um, there. So, so that's effectively the, the four Bs as part of the project. Um, two of the ones, um, show, these are the maps again for the large scabious mining bee on the left and the small scabious mining bee on the right. 
uh, I think there's definitely opportunities to look for um, both the species, but particularly the small scale is mind you within Carmarthenshire. As you can see, Carmarthenshire is really the missing link. We need to link up a lot of South Wales there. Um, and I don't really believe that they're on the Gower and Pembrokeshire are not kind of in between, but who knows, I suppose, um, until we kind of get out and really look for them, um, we probably won't, won't really know. So that's where we kind of need your help really, I suppose, in looking for all these bees when you happen to be in areas that are full of field scabious, small scabious, or uh, devil's bit scabious. Um, and you're, you're all, well, your botanical knowledge would all be far greater than, than mine, but just a, just a quick mention that, of course, you get field scabious and small scabious more in sort of well-drained soils, um, and devil's bit scabious, of course, really likes those damp um, areas, a nice sort of roast pasture sort of habitat. Um, and all of these sort of what we commonly call scabious flowers are obviously quite distinctive. So nice, nice, tall, almost look like pin cushions, um, really, really lovely, attractive looking plants. Um, and this is just a, a photograph of one of the sites, um, new sites that we found for the small scabious mining bee this year. Um, and this is um, a site in Newport. So this is probably one of the best finds we've had um, this year uh, to find this species. Uh, it was the first time it'd been recorded um, within Gwent. Um, and these are kind of like the areas that I would personally target. So where you've got really dense patches of flowers. So I'm sure many of you are familiar kind of with walking through areas of marshy grass and when the devil's bit scabious is flowering. And it's got that, when they're really dense, you've got a really vibrant sort of purpley color. So you're kind of looking for those areas that are really dense flowers. And they tend to be the best sort of spots for you to go look in uh, for these uh, special sort of associated uh, bee species. Uh, if you need to, uh, of course, find out um, where these plants are located uh, within your area. Um, I'm sure you kind of, most of you kind of know um, your area very well. Um, but if you're not, not sure, this, the SBI have got some really good um, handy maps. So you can go on their website and look up um, particular plant species like uh, field scabious or something and kind of show you kind of where they've been recorded. So that can be quite handy when kind of trying to locate sites. Um, the Adairin, which is the, the Wales uh, recording database, uh, records database, they can they have these handy distribution maps. You can create a distribution map for, for either the, well, for any of the bees featured or um, any of the host plants as well. You can create little maps and get quite good resolution and work out where um, nearer sites may be. Um, and in terms of field equipment, uh, you don't really need a lot. I, I'd say the camera is a really key thing because uh, we'd really need to sort of see um, I suppose proof really that there was that particular species and not something that looks very similar. So if you get a photograph of what you think uh, could be one of these species, then, then that'd be great. Um, of course, you can have an insect net if you want to capture them and have a closer look. If you want to put them in pots or jars um, and that sort of thing and have a closer look with a hand lens. Uh, a notebook is always handy, uh, unless you've got really good memory and can remember exactly kind of where you was and you know what, what sort of uh, habitat it was and that sort of thing. Um, and one thing that I'm probably obliged to mention really is that uh, if you go out deliberately to target these species and do surveys, then um, it's, it's really important that you sort of seek landowner permission. But of course, if you're walking through on a public footpath and there's a common, you know, right away and you just happen to see these bees, um, then it's a different story then. Um, in terms of finding bees, uh, the weather is really key. Solitary bees are incredibly fussy. Uh, so they're not as easy to just go out and sort of record bumblebees. Uh, when you're doing solitary bees, it's like a different um, league again. Uh, temperature is really key. So a lot of bees are active during the warmest and brightest part of the day. So that can be quite important. So it's no point going out really early or really late in the day because uh, they would have already would either not be out or they would have already finished um, doing what they want to do. Um, cloud cover is really key. So really you need to be targeting days that are ideally sunny or at least sort of um, light cloud, the very minimum, I would say, but ideally sort of sunny intervals or completely sunny um, because solitary bees don't like overcast conditions. Um, so they're very, very particular in that sense. So you'll only get sort of honeybees and bumblebees really on overcast days um, and wind as well as a key thing. So if it's really breezy day, you need to be looking for more sheltered locations, uh, but ideally kind of picking days that are stiller as well. So ideally you want to be going out doing nice warm sunny days uh, so typical sort of summer days, um, maybe not summer days in Wales, but, you know, typical summer days. Um, in terms of just the things to record, um, if you're all familiar with biological recording, um, then you'll know all this before. Um, but it's basically the key things really are a date, um, a location, 
and particularly if you can get a grid reference that's really useful um, and a photograph in order to help us to confirm that it is definitely that species and not something else um, other things are useful as well like um, a brief description of the habitat to so say if you're on a meadow or you're on a marshy grassland or cliff top grassland or so forth and if you knew that you were looking at a male or a female or even if you had an idea of the number of bees that you've seen that could also be handy as well but it's again it's not really key the main thing is the date location and a photograph uh, if you want to kind of know more about bees and get more into um, bee identification then the field guide uh, to the bees of Great Britain and Ireland by Stephen Falk is really the Bible. Um, it's about sort of £25, I think, or thereabouts. So it's, it's really quite good price, I think, for what it is. And it covers um, almost all of the British bees. We've added a few more since it got published in 2015. Um, for a really, really good book. It's got some really good information in it as well. Uh, Stephen Falk has also got a really incredible Flickr page. So if you type in Stephen Falk Flickr um, into like Google, get up his sort of live images and he's got images of all the UK species of bee and he has both um, live specimens as well as pinned specimens that show kind of key characteristics for identification so it's basically like having a, a museum collection really um, to, just a couple of bits away so really really handy and he's got a lot of other invertebrates not just bees as well. Um, the Bees Wasp Financial Corn Society have a, um, a website and um, so Bee Wars website and that's got species accounts for all of the UK bees, wasps and ants. Uh, and that's got some really handy maps like those featured in the talk today. So you can look at the distribution of species. Um, and Bug Life have um, the Wales Threatened Bee Report, which was uh, published a few years ago. It has got some good information on some of our more threatened bee species within Wales. Um, and it features um, all of the species that I've talked about today in a little bit um, more detail, I suppose. Um, and talks about habitat management and other things as well if you need to find out uh, those sort of things as a, a landowner or land manager. Um, so that's pretty me, pretty much me done. Um, I'd be really grateful if you wouldn't mind filling in a very quick sort of three minute survey just to say whether you enjoyed yourself or not. Um, which is part of our funding. So I'd like to pop that into the chat or I'll pop that into the chat and perhaps Andrew might be able to email it round um, as well, perhaps um, at a later date. Um, but I'd be really grateful if you could do that as well. So that's basically it. I, I realise that um, we're sort of uh, doing this at the wrong time of year, really. And I'm talking about bees in the middle um, of winter, more or less. Um, but um, just, I was just keen to kind of really speak to you while we had the funding to do it. Um, of course, the project finishes um, on Monday and I'll be pretty much us done with it. But we, we're still keen for people to get out and look. and anyone is more than welcome to send me images of any bees that you see, but particularly if you see these species as well. Um, and of course, if we get any records from any of you or anyone else, then we'll be sharing these then with the local record centres, uh, which would be WWBIC for, for you lot in Carmarthenshire, um, and the Bees Watch Financial Corn Society and County Recorders and landowners as well. So, so that's it. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and if you ever need to contact me, this is my uh, email address or you can contact me at wales at buglife.org.uk as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Liam. Um, you've already covered this, but I was going to ask, is that a good book to, to, <laughs> to get? I think it is, yeah. Um, so I'm glad you recommended that. Um, it's, a, it's a tough book in the sense that yeah. it's got proper keys to species which unless you go sitting down at a microscope and yeah it's quite difficult but I think the actual the illustrations in it that are done by Richard Lewington are absolutely stunning and they can be brilliant um, and I think the actual pages for each of the species that tell you the habitat and flight period and all that I think is brilliant so I think it's still well worth having and even if you just get into bees you can flick through it and almost just kind of work out what group of bees you're in at least um, it's quite handy so yeah well worth getting yeah um, there's a couple of questions come up. Um, I used to work on bumblebees and honeybees, actually, at, oh, right. at Rothamsted Research. Um, and I've never really had much to do with solitary bees. Um, you can cope with identifying bumblebees. There's not that many of them. Solitary yeah. bees are quite tricky. So um, they're sort of a lot less well known. Yeah, that's right. By a lot of people. But um, the 
the large scabious mining bee, um, is it very rare in Wales because we don't have much calcareous areas? I mean, we've got a sort of seam of it going along the bottom, but yeah. there's not a lot, is there? No, I think that's definitely the yeah habitat restriction there um, quite a bit. So um, yeah, it tends to be yeah places like Gower and yeah anywhere you've got those sort of more natural limestone outcrops and that sort of thing. Yeah. You get it, but yeah, it's very going to be limited by the habitat more than anything. Well, in Carmarthenshire, that. we've got Carmel, the the wildlife trust reserve, which is okay. Um, I mean that is limestone there's there's sinkholes there even but uh, uh -huh. yeah so uh, the other thing i found very interesting i mean do the small scabious mining be it's goes it, it's foraging on um devil's bit scabious is it that specific? Are they that specific that they forage on only one plum? Yeah, as far as we know, that's um, the only thing that, that those sort of uh, later populations will forage on. Um, so I know uh, people have asked me this in previous talks as well, but as, as it stands, that species is known only, it only collects pollen from those. It might visit other plants briefly for nectar, um, but but in terms of collecting pollen, it'll only collect pollen from, from those plants. So. That's really that's ten that's spent to bees tend to spend most of the time collecting pollen, then it's quite handy then uh, that you can just kind of look for these plants and then see if they're foraging yeah. on plants. But um but yeah, as it as it stands, we only know that they use them and, and not some, you know, in the in the case of like um the large scabious mining bee that's foraging on field scabious, people have asked me if they'll use sort of um non-native sort of associated almost like garden um cultivars almost and we don't really know if they do um at, at present we only know that they're using those plants um but it could be an area of research for somebody <laughs> mm. <laughs> who knows it's not, not really enough people really looking um at solitary bees in enough detail to know these things half the time it it, it seems to be the case that when uh things get tough it's extreme specialists that come off worst if you're a generalist you're not in such trouble yeah that's right yeah <laughs> um there's a question here from jessica is it correct that the presence of honeybees can threaten or overwhelm solitary bees yeah, there's quite, quite a lot of evidence of that now, and I think it's growing um, all the time. Um, yeah, there's um, it's quite a lot of um, evidence for disease transfer, um, more so from honeybees to bumblebees, because largely because research hasn't focused on um, disease transfer from honeybees to solitary bees. Uh, there's a little bit of evidence coming through to show that there is disease transfer to solitary bees, but we don't quite know what impact that disease transfer is having. We know um, that it, you know, can impact um, bumblebee populations. Um, yeah. There's still not really full effects um, of that at the moment. Um, as well as disease transfer, one of the biggest thing really is disturbance, and that's probably going to be the biggest effect for solitary bees. So they don't really like to be disturbed. So having large numbers of honeybees regularly visiting flowers, they, they might actually put the solitary bees off from actually foraging on those plants in the first instance, because they don't like that. And and honeybees also scent mark when they land on flowers as well. So the honeybees are basically covering the flowers in honeybee scent. That's obviously off putting for a number of solitary bees as well. So I think it's a lot more to be done, I think, on the impacts of, of honeybees, but it's, um, it is, you know, generally concerning. Um, and yeah, I think it's an area that needs more investigation, certain. Okay. Uh, there's a comment from Perks here saying i sometimes see large scabious the mining bee i guess on netweed now i presume that that would be only um should only be visiting it for nectar i would yeah. thought yeah there's no evidence that they collect it for you know the pollen on it but um but yeah um all bees need nectar so they need that sugary source to keep going so they'll visit um, other plants for nectar as well um but but yeah you probably yeah Quite, quite lucky, I suppose, to see that. Um, I don't often see bees nectar, nectaring so much as often collecting the pollen. <laughs> mm. It's really nice to see. Good to know. On, on one of the uh, bumblebee 
ecology projects we were working on, you could sort of generalize in with asteraceae flowers um, in sort of decreasing order of attractiveness for forage. It's the purple ones, the yellow ones and the white ones. <laughs> All right, that's quite handy. <laughs> it was true of bumblebees anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I tend to find that as well. Although yellow. <laughs> <laughs> right uh if there's no more questions for liam uh thank you very much indeed that was a fascinating talk and we hope people will be out there next spring having a good look round at the scabious flowers yeah and of course you've recorded this so hopefully you'll be able yes. to in next spring when you've we, forgotten it all <laughs> that's right it, it will go on our youtube channel